Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Hi, what's up? How's it going, buddy? Hey, it's going okay. How are you feeling? You feeling fresh? You feeling good? You ready to talk about this subject for the rest of your life? I'm so fresh and so good. Cool. So, uh, my name is Justin. I go by Django Science Lad on the internet. Uh, I had a video come out about a year ago, and I'm gonna guess that mo uh, there's a lot of arguments from that video that people have told you, and most notably like the uh, height matching thing that you don't seem to be convinced by, and I'm hoping that because I'm so smart and handsome and sweet that I can convince you uh, to come a little bit closer to my position. Okay. Sound good? I hope it's going to be on more than the height thing, but okay. <laughs> All right. So the reason we have sex categorizations in sport in the first place, uh, in my mind, it comes down to the fact that men, on average, can put on a lot more muscle on their frame and carry a lot less fat than women can. And that's due to the hormonal differences between them. Very, very uh, distant second to that is that uh, men, again, thanks to that testosterone, can have more hemoglobin in their blood, which uh, therefore means more oxygen carrying capacity in their blood. And then everything else is ancillary. Like those are those are the two factors. And if we can address those through hormone replacement therapy for trans people, I think that this creates a reasonable expectation of fairness, even with there are other factors that could contribute to sports performance not being taken care of. Um, I would say the physiological structure, like the bone structure, which also goes into height, is also like a significant sexual advantage as well. But those so are I would say that yeah, so height is absolutely an advantage. Uh, other stuff like bone density doesn't it doesn't seem to play a I also haven't factor. been following along like, with as long as you have enough today. not to when get someone injured, me bone density bones non contractile tissue it's not going to help you run faster jump higher or anything like that uh, but at the height absolutely I think that I think that bone density is going to be a pretty important factor when it comes to things like resistance training I think resistance training is probably going to get you sprinting and running faster so like when we talk about our ability to like squat or move like big weights I think that your bones do become denser as a result of that type of resistance training and being able to move bigger weights there will probably have some carryover effect for the purposes of this conversation i guess um i'm not going to say that like having denser bones like confers a one-to-one -one athletic advantage but i'm pretty sure that things like female athletes like deal with things related to osteoporosis or lack of like bone density can have negative impacts on their training which will lead to their academic or not academic, their athletic output but i guess it's not like a one-to-one -one thing we don't have to focus on that now but i i, I just i just want to say like i wouldn't just give that, that up completely yeah i know there's a there's an argument that uh, like bone density is something I hear brought up a lot, but uh, I think the reverse is true. Like it's the the training, the weight training, the squatting, all that stuff increases bone density. And but it's the actual training. You're building more muscle. You're mm -hmm. subject, uh, you're subjecting yourself to a whole bunch of weights and resistance training. Mm -hmm. That's going to build bone tissue, but it's the resistance training that is going to improve your athletic performance. Yeah, and my understanding is men have a slightly easier time doing that. That might not be the case. Maybe that's not the case. But I thought that men um, in general have less to worry about when it comes to like osteoporosis or things related to bone density. That is true. So that's absolutely true, but that's uh, the best thing you can do to prevent osteopenia and osteoporosis is to be active, specifically as an impact or resistance exercise. It's the best thing you can do regardless of gender, and women who do participate in, in sport or resistance training or mm -hmm. impact activities are going to hold on to their bone density uh, much, much longer, and it can actually really, 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 uh, re not maybe not reverse osteoporosis, but they can reverse osteopenia in some circumstances sure. and dr greatly uh, reduce their risk. Sure. Um, I'll almost agree with you that one word there though is regardless of gender um the help is going to be regardless of gender but the problem i think is pretty unique to sex i'll say um because like i don't think that like n and i could be wrong i'm 33 now but i don't think like 99 percent of men up to like even age 55 worry about osteoporosis um whereas women i think can start to worry about that at pretty early ages especially if they do a lot of resistance training to where they're taking like sometimes multivitamins or eating special diets um to be aware of like the extra risks i think even i watched a little bit of your video but i think you covered that the concept of like the female triad um although they have different mm -hmm. names for it now that there are like some unique challenges that, that women face but like i think that these can be largely overcome with proper diet and nutrition probably yeah absolutely and so, yeah, women are, regardless of training status, are going to be more at risk. But with the issue of bone density, it's like, again, is it a limiting factor in exercise? Is it a limiting factor in sports performance? And up to a point of, like, not getting injured? No, not really. Like, having stronger bones is not going to confer an advantage. Because, again, they're non-contractile tissue. They can't impart force onto something. Uh, so it doesn't seem to be – I can't find any – evidence of that being a factor. I, I can find plenty of evidence going the other way, like being active helps your bones, and that's mm -hmm. great, but that's not what we're talking about when, in terms of performance. Okay. Okay. Um, the other one is height. Can I try to convince you on the height question? Um, yeah, you not can try. Yeah, sure. 
All right, so height is absolutely an advantage in a lot of sports. I'm not gonna, I will bite that bullet 100%. That is absolutely true. Being taller is usually very important in sports. However, this is this applies to sports in general, not just when we're talking about trans women in uh, sports. Mm -hmm. And so we have to look at like, well, how is height treated? Since it is an advantage, how is it treated in every other medium of sports? How is it treated in every other avenue of sports? Mm -hmm. And the and it seems to be treated not at all. Like we know it's an advantage, but then we don't do anything about it. We don't have height categories. We don't have height divisions. Uh, I would it, argue so that like that, things that have like weight categories arguably have height categories, but in a lot of sports you don't have weight classes. So sure. No, that's true. So in yeah, uh, so height is going to correlate with weight a lot. Mm -hmm. However, if we have let's say you have two fighters both competing at uh, you know bantam weight or something like that, mm -hmm. uh, if one of them is five five and the other one is six three. Like, there are some height advantages there, longer reach and stuff like that, but we would still consider that a fair matchup because, mm -hmm. you know, the, they're going to have probably an, an equivalent amount of, like, contractile tissue. Yeah, a shorter guy's going to have a lot more muscle, right? Because he's not as tall. He right. doesn't have to carry around so much bone and shit, yeah. Yeah, and that's, and that's related to why I think it is important to control for heights when uh, determining these studies. So I think... Well, the, the, I like, guess, like, the, the challenging part, though, is that height is one of the biggest factors driven by our sexual dimorphism like it's a it's hugely driven by sex i yeah and i agree that it, that is correct so it seems weird but, to just like hand wave that when it is like one of the largest most obviously apparent differences between men and women are their height i don't want to hand wave it away because mm -hmm. it is a very important factor but i'm saying that we don't see it as an unfair intolerable advantage when it comes to uh any other sort of sport like it's it's the the muscle tissue like so it, for example like do you think it's fair for uh, a, a five six man and a five six woman uh, to compete in the same weight category of Olympic lifting. No. So, of course not. So even though we've controlled for height, even though we've controlled for weight, the advantage, the reason that's unfair, is because the man can pack on way more muscle and carry way less fat mm -hmm. on 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 his frame. And sure. That's why it's unfair. And so that when we're talking about like why do we have these six categorizations this is the one that makes the most sense to me and i think it has the most uh, scientific justification behind it i guess that the issue that i run into then though is that if we're looking at trans women as a collective and we're looking at cis women as a collective trans women start on average at the 98th percentile of height for cis women so it seems like mm -hmm. the pool of people we're going to be drawing from is already skewed pretty heavily and it's skewed because of a sexually driven difference when the categories are divided by sex. I don't know how that I don't know how that is an okay thing. It seems like we're now we're running into a huge a huge statistical advantage that is literally coming from what we're trying to control with the categories. Yeah. So there's two uh, ways I would address that. One is that when you look at broad categories, general populations, the further you get into sports, the more elite you get, the less like the average person they look like. So the average height of a woman in the United States is, I think, about 5'4". Mm -hmm. And if you look at the average height of a WNBA player, the, uh, the average height is about six feet. So you're not already, you're, you're skimming off the top. You're, you're yeah, uh, but athletes self -select Whatever distribution we're skimming off of for the average population, we're, we're starting with different distributions, right? So you mentioned mm -hmm. accurate that the average height of a woman NBA player is six feet tall. The average height of a male NBA player is six foot six. So if mm -hmm. we're going to skim off the top of the cis female category, we can't say that, well, look, now they're even with trans women because we'd be skimming off the top of the trans women category as well, right? Yeah, that, and that is true. Um, I, I still think it's an okay thing to like think about. Like uh, in, when you look at population averages, like, yeah, the be best thing that's going to do is give you a broader pool to skim off the top. You're going to have more of a top to skim from. But then you get into like the other way I would address that. Like if we looked at the average heights of like uh, countries, for example, like the average height of an American, like uh, I think I wrote this down. I think there's a country in Sweden where the average uh, woman's height is like five, eight. And then there's a country where the average woman's height is like 411 but we still but so it, we're same problem is presented like you have this statistical pop, like you have this these two disparate populations where sti statistically i can't speak today uh -huh. where statistically they have way uh like disproportionate uh, rates of height yeah. but we would still consider it fair for like these two countries to compete in the olympics uh -huh. but why do we consider it fair it doesn't that's 
oh, that's philosophy. And I think the reason why we consider it fair is because we, we accept that there's going to be some range of what exists in the male and female category, and that range can compete against each other. But the broad categories of male and female should not compete against each other, even if there is some overlap in some traits. I think that's why that's like the main difference for why I feel like this particular one isn't as easy a sell, because some people want to hand wave the height thing, but height is like one of the, like it's an incredibly important thing athletically, and it's massively driven by sexual differences. So that's why I've always felt like it's a little weird to just like hand wave that away, when it's definitely a sexually driven difference that definitely converts yeah, I, hope I, I hope it doesn't sound like I'm hand waving it away. Mm -hmm. Like height is a very important thing. But or when it, I say hand wave, not, I guess when we say like, well, we'll control for that and then it'll be okay. And it's like, well. Oh, when I, when yeah. I say control for it, I mean when you're comparing muscle mass. Uh, sure. So, so okay. I want to come back to that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we can come back. I don't think we have to settle this point here, but it might come up in the future. Yeah. Uh, fuck. Uh, yeah, so height is absolutely an advantage, but I don't think it's as big an, as, as big an advantage as muscle tissue. Like that is going to be the biggest driver of athletic performance. How much force can you produce with your body? So that's a that is going to be a benefit in just about every single sport, even when it comes to like endurance sports, uh, the ability to produce uh, like if you can bring mm -hmm. up the strength of your endurance muscles, it's yeah. going to you know every step's going to be mm -hmm. more. So muscle tissue is going to be the primary driver. Sure. There. I agree with that. Although I will say caveat that carefully that muscle tissue is going to be a function oftentimes of your height. Right, taller people yes. can pack on more mass. So, but absolutely. But yeah, so yeah, I agree with you. Okay. And and that's why I'm going to criticize the Hilton Lundberg study. Like, so the standard of fairness that they set, which, which sounds reasonable on its surface, is: Do trans women have an equivalent or statistically like insignificantly uh, different level of lean body mass compared to cis women? Mm -hmm. That seems very reasonable. But I think it's you know, if it was met, uh, if that was your standard of fairness. If trans women met that standard, they would be not competitive at all. They'd be emaciated, walking skeletons. They probably couldn't uh, climb up a flight of stairs, let alone be competitive in a sport. Because in order for a 5'9", so the average height of uh, the trans women in the study were somewhere around 5'9". Yep. Which again, average height of this just mount, yeah. Mm -hmm. But it, so if they did have, if they met the uh, uh, standard that was being set, they would have to have the uh, muscle of an average like 5'4", untrained woman. Like they'd be emaciated. They would not be competitive. So they've met the standard of fairness, and in doing so, now they can't. There's no way they're going to be competitive in any sport. Okay. So I think that's important because yeah, taller people do pack on more muscle mass. Like if you've got a group of five nine women, they're going to have way more muscle mass than uh, five four women, mm -hmm. just because they're taller. They have more muscle. They have more uh, sarcomeres and muscle fibers in series, just because there's a greater distance between attachment points of the muscle. Mm -hmm. They have to. And having more in series doesn't really confer the same amount of uh, force advantage uh, as fibers in parallel that's where you get your power increasing cross-sectional areas like uh, cutting a cutting a muscle uh, like widthwise mm -hmm. like yeah a longer muscle isn't necessarily a stronger one a thicker muscle is a stronger one well don't you also have like more leverage and everything as well assuming you've got like longer limbs to work with too that one's tough because it's you know every muscle in your body mm -hmm. well just about every muscle in your body uh is a third class lever which means they're always operating at a huge mechanical disadvantage so uh for example if you have like you you go to the gym right sure you, do you squat and deadlift yep so yeah long arms means you're going to suck at the bench but you're going to be great at the deadlift I've, so this is a meme that I hear a lot, and I hear a lot of tall weightlifters cope with this one a lot. Um, but when you look at like who holds the records for a lot of powerlifting stuff, they're really tall guys. Um, yeah, even I on an exercise like the deadlift, which when I, I say long, yeah. When I say when I say long, oh, I you mean, mean like comparatively, proportionally? Long. Okay. Compared, yeah, if right. you're like a lanky dude, but you're also like five eight, and you've got long arms, you're probably probably pretty fucked. That's possible, right. sure. If you, and if you're six two and you're built like a fire hydrant, mm -hmm. so like you're gonna go to the bench even though you're tall. Sure, depending on sure. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so that one's a little bit tougher because it, it would have like more to do with like the muscle muscle attachment side. Okay. And it's hard to say like what is good, like mus like uh, longer limbs, like a longer limb and a really terrible muscular attachment site mm -hmm. makes you a great sprinter, but a horrendous powerlifter. Sure. Yeah. So there's a lot that goes on in, into that, and it's hard <laughs> to say like definitively. Like there's no there's not going to be an answer like in terms of like lever lens and anthropometry mm -hmm. that makes you better at every single sport. Sure. It'll be sport specific and then muscle attachment right. site or cross sectional specific, right? Um, you also seemed a little bit skeptical when I uh, <clears throat> when I made the claim that like lung capacity is not a big factor in sports performance. You seem skeptical of that. Um, 
I don't, I don't know enough, honestly. Um, I'm familiar with the arguments that like when you're doing high endurance activities, your overall lung capacity is not like the limiting factor. Uh, based mm -hmm. on my experience, like running cross country, that's probably true. I, I'm not aware of any sports where you are inhaling and exhaling the most possible. Um, even swimmers probably don't. Like, I don't think you're ever stopping to like, <gasps> like fill your entire lungs to do something. So that wouldn't surprise me if that was the case. Um, I think the more important thing is, I think as you mentioned, the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. Yeah, oxygen carrying capacity of the blood, the size and uh, uh, compliance of a heart. So you want a big mm -hmm. heart that fills up with the blood and squeezes all of it out. Yeah. And you want to train your muscles to suck more oxygen out of the blood. But the actual the surface area for gas exchange, which is what lung capacity is, doesn't seem to be a, a big deal. Mm -hmm. With the with ironically, with the exception of swimming, but in that case, it's just because you have bigger bags of air that keep you floating sure. easier. And so in that specific case, like, yeah, it's just the fact that they're big bags of air. But in terms of like uh, a performance capacity, other than that, uh, no, larger lungs uh, with the exception. Of, as long as your lungs are healthy and with the exception of like the crazy ultra endurance sports, um, like it's not going to be a limiting factor in any in any sport. Mm hmm. So that's what I, I would say. And then those two things, like the, your, the ability of your muscles to pull oxygen out of the blood, isn't the biggest factor. The biggest factor in endurance performance is like getting more oxygen to your muscle is going to be that big, strong, compliant heart. And the myocardium, that's a muscle. And it's going to uh, respond to testosterone just like skeletal muscle would. Mm -hmm. And so that would, I would, cons I would assume, and I, I would, it's been shown that that is affected by testosterone uh, suppression. So it does seem to be reasonable to expect heart size to also uh, be mitigated and uh, to reduce a little bit sure but I think this is kind of where all of the all of the longitudinal data so far shows that there is a reduction but it's not it doesn't seem to be much I think is like the issue that comes up that as long as you it's kind of like if you're working on a cut right like as long as you're providing some challenging stimulus to the muscles they're not going to go away completely even if you're like on a caloric deficit even if you're like missing protein you can like resist some amount of like muscle catabolization or whatever muscle breakdown or whatever by just making sure you continue resistance training and it seems to be the case that for trans athletes even when they begin that testosterone suppression as long as they continue to train they still maintain a lot of the advantages that they had when they were training in the male body yeah, of course they're gonna. Yeah, if they're obviously, any, if, if anyone's training, they're gonna hold on to way more muscle than if they just got, stop training mm -hmm. altogether. Yeah. However, uh, depending on what the HRT is, um, if you have, it takes protein synthesis in order to maintain that muscle tissue. Yep. And so, if you uh, suppress androgen receptors, you're going to drastically reduce the rate of protein synthesis that you can have. That's why, like, even when you have uh, the very limited data on trans athletes that we have, mm -hmm. even though they're still training, they're still losing quite a bit of muscle mass. They are I losing. Yeah, course, I yeah. do not argue. Um, I do not argue that they don't start at a much higher, uh, they, they have a head start on that. Mm -hmm. But I think it's reasonable after a long enough period of, of time that two athletes who have been training for similar amounts of time, a cis woman and a trans woman, after a long enough period of time on testosterone suppression, I think it's reasonable to assume that they're going to reach pretty comparable levels of muscle mass. I don't know if that's ever going to be the case. I don't know if that's true. Um, I do want more data on it. If you had, if we just think of like, if we think of two young men, um, and we take them at age 18, and we've got one guy that is hardcore cycling on and off of you know different steroids, and he does this for like six years, and then you get the other guy who's like full natty his whole life, right? At age 24, the, the guy on gear is gonna be massive compared to the guy, the other guy, the natty guy at 24, assuming the same biology and everything, right? If we go to 25 or 26, even when the guy on gear is cycled off, and we'll assume that his like hormone levels aren't fucked, he's done this response or whatever, he's still gonna be bigger. By the time we hit age 30, I would imagine if they're both training similarly, like he's still gonna be bigger. Maybe not as much, maybe we'd expect to see those differences disappear over time, but he's always gonna retain some of those advantages. Um, it's not like his muscle is gonna magically waste away, I don't think, and then just become like the same guy that was the natty dude. I feel like the guy on gear is always gonna retain some of that advantage. Maybe, but probably I would say it's more likely than not. A long enough period of getting off of gear, you're probably going to go back to whatever your genetic limit was anyway. You definitely had an easier time getting there than the full natural guy, uh, but there's still an upper limit for it. Because the reason there's a limit well, in the first place, it's the reason yeah. why uh, natty guys like can only get so big, mm -hmm. is because there's just an upper limit of protein synthesis. In their yeah, sure, for what you can carry and a variety of other things too. I don't yeah. necessarily disagree with that, but now the issue becomes that like. Um, now the issue becomes like, what is that time period, right? It's definitely not one year. 
um, probably not two or three based on the studies that I've been arguing about recently. The, I think the biggest review that I saw in 2021 from the British Journal of Medicine um, showed that even after three years, there's some advantage. When we hit like this three or four year mark, it feels like we've effectively eliminated trans women from sports. Like if you're starting to say that like you need four years to go and compete in your um, in the league that you identify with, well, I'm guessing they're not competing in cis leagues for those four years. That takes them completely out of college sports. Like who knows how much of like high school sports they miss. Like it feels like we basically cut them out of sports at that point anyway. No, that's true. But I think I uh, I think it's reasonable to say that like but uh, again depending on the sport, I think one year for endurance based sports is probably enough uh, because like you know the physical force is probably not the, the most important thing like uh like total like the you know, maximum amount of physical force it's like the oxygen carrying capacity and that's addressed pretty quickly through hormones like the hemoglobin hemoglobin levels of trans women go down to that of uh, cis levels and then just an extra little buffer period seems to be okay uh for like team sports which tend to be a mix of power and endurance probably two years i would say uh and that's a reasonable I would say time frame I, for so, so for endurance sports um, because I used to parrot this talking point a lot. I, that sounds really negative. I used to use, say, use this talking point because I thought it was true, but um, I had a lot of people email me. Apparently, even in like ultra endurance sports, like I think there's like one or two very limited exceptions, but even in endurance sports, men still outcompete women like pretty hardcore. Like there's that's still... true, but for this, this, it's the same reason that um, uh, I, I gave earlier. Oh, They're not only carrying... because of hemoglobin, which is like very quickly remediated or remediated. Yeah, no, by... no, not not because. Well, some because of hemoglobin, and also because like if you're taking that frame for I don't know what's an ultra. Uh, what's an ultra marathon? Uh, Probably like fifty miles? fucking miles or something. Yeah, but you're two, carrying a lot two, of extra fat, right? Yeah, they're, yeah. So uh, the woman, even if they're the same size, the woman has to carry all this extra fat, and that fat is not going to. Uh, that's a, that's a not a performance advantage. It's just, but it's isn't just dead weight. so? Here's a question, um, mm -hmm. and I'm actually I'm genuinely asking this because I don't know. Um, I do know that women need to carry uh, greater proportions of body fat than men to survive. That at, like, yes. at the body fats, like I think when you get to like sub, it might even be 12% for a woman, like you run into risks of like serious medical problems and at like 9% you could die. Whereas some insane guys can cut down to like three or 4%, although it's difficult. Um, yeah. Does a trans woman, because she doesn't carry the same parts, like the ovaries and all of that, and because her um, her hormones are externally provided and very smooth compared to a cis woman, does she, is she able to just exist at lower levels of body fat, or do those same harms exist for a trans woman as a cis woman? I legitimately do not know. I don't have the background in endocrinology to say for sure. Mm -hmm. Because I, I feel I like... Wanna, um, I don't want to say something that's like not true. Yeah, because I feel like one of the biggest issues, um, and I'll just say this because I don't know a lot of people know this, one of the biggest problems that women have versus men isn't even necessarily that they can't train as hard because of the testosterone stuff, the testosterone stuff which is true, but it's that like a woman's body has to carry like a way bigger percentage of body fat than a man's does because when women dip below those levels, it becomes dangerous to their health at, at like way bigger percentage than for men but now I'm, I'm curious if trans women have to worry about that since they don't have all the same like machinery you know or the same i would want to i would want to do more research into that if it's if there's even any research that's been done sure like can they can they suffer from like the not the, they wouldn't suffer from the athlete triad but they i want to know if there's health consequences if they get their body fat levels too low mm -hmm. that's because that's it is one of the biggest reasons why you can't just like put women, men and yeah. women in the same weight category because women can't cut to uh, like eight percent and be healthy and not die or yeah, something they can, right? yeah but they cannot do that mm -hmm. uh men men six percent body fat you generally is like you're gonna be really really ripped mm -hmm. and then there's not that extra weight so you can like max out the amount of muscle you have minimize the amount of fat you have and like really optimize what your body can do at that given weight but a woman is always going to have that uh, that padding both, mm -hmm. both figuratively and literally sure. uh that they have to keep and that's not again non-contractile tissue not going to help them be competitive mm -hmm. but they have to keep it otherwise they're going to be very very unhealthy and uh possibly like damage their health mm -hmm. Um, well, we can leave that on the table, I guess. I won't use that as a gotcha. We'll just leave that for now. Um, no, it is a very good question. I do want to know what the research says on it. Sure. Um, along the same line of questioning, though, um, how do you feel about the fact that because trans women's hormones are provided externally, even against cis women, they kind of have like a woman advantage and that they don't have to worry about fluctuating hormones like a cis woman that deals with periods would? Do we just consider this like, oh, that's just a trans advantage or... Um, I don't know because like um, w with the research, there's a little bit of uh, differences in training that you can use to optimize your menstru menstrual cycle, but it's never going to be like a night or day factor. Assuming like other than like not feeling good on on certain days, mm -hmm. and that fluctuation of hormones can affect like what parts of your training cycle like are going to be best for strength training and when is good to hold off a little bit. But I don't know if it reaches the 
level that it would be like that a super unfair advantage okay so we just don't worry about that one as much um Okay, what one, else? Of the, one of the things that the female athlete triad is like amenorrhea. They stop getting their periods, which mm -hmm. is a really, really bad thing. It, yeah. And it seems like if you take away the periods, take away that, well, that's a disadvantage. Like, well, yeah, that but that's, that's different because their lack of period is driven by like stress that fucks up with their hormone fluctuations. But a trans woman yeah. doesn't have to worry about that because her um, hormones come externally, right? She doesn't have to worry about that. I don't, I don't think it's, I could is... be wrong. No, hold on. I know I'm not wrong, actually. Um, women cannot have periods, and it's fine, even though a lot of women are really paranoid about it, because there are certain types of birth control that women can go on, and, they're, and they can lose their periods forever. Now, a lot of women don't like to do that just because they get paranoid about losing their periods, but there's no evidence that this is harmful for them. So I think women losing their periods um, when they're doing like heavy athletic stuff, it's not bad for the body because they're missing their periods. It's because whatever thing is stressing their body out so much and is fucking with their hormones causes their periods to go away. That's true. Yeah, I, I didn't mean to imply, imply mm -hmm. the other way. No, yeah, it's fine. No, that is true. Uh -huh. um, can, some guy is spamming in my chat about this, but I don't know. This. He's talking about tendon strength and reaction time. Tendon strength is a function of muscle strength. Like tendons are just interwoven throughout the muscle. Isn't it a so little like, bit again, different though? Like when I, so I know for so, some training that I do, like people will say like on certain exercises, you have to slow down a little bit on this because like your tendons won't be able to keep up with your muscles. They develop a little bit slower so you can like stress them and strain them depending on the exercise you're um, doing That's really only a problem if you're on uh, like performance enhancing drugs. Like because tendons are, so tendons are interwoven throughout the muscle. Like every layer of the muscle, each individual muscle fiber, then each individual like fascicle, then the entire muscle are all covered in a piece of connective tissue and that then forms the tendon, which is then continuous with like the peri and stuff like that. Okay. So the tendons, uh, the reason they can't keep up with muscle is because they're connected tissue. They, don't, they have a lot of matrix. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a lot of non-living cells and uh, much, much, much worse blood supply. And so they're not going to be able to regenerate you know, and the protein synthesis through. and all that as much as the other muscles. Okay, sure. Yeah. So and that, but muscle can it can keep up. But but generally, it's like you're not gonna unless if, unless you're just using dog shit technique. Mm -hmm. um, like a, and the there's no real reason that your tendons can't keep up. Gotcha. Okay, that might have just been uh, a, other than a like extreme okay. circumstances. Yeah. Sure. Uh, what about myonuclei? Myonuclei. Um, um, the idea that these things are like once you've done some strength training, uh, you never lose this type of development, and this is why you get like old strength. Like if people have trained a long time ago, they can re resume training and they never lose this advantage. So this would be like something that a trans woman that's trained as a in a male's body basically. Um, we'll hold on to that advantage forever. Essentially. This is going to be, this is going to be more related to like the nervous system. So like beginner gains and all that fun stuff is like how quickly can you uh, recruit all of your, Muscle how quickly fibers. can you recruit uh, different motor units, uh, and so. But that's a function of like the percentages of, of things that you have. Mm -hmm. So not necessarily like uh, the whole muscle memory thing is more like, you know, uh, like neurological memory more than anything else. And so, like, yeah, if you've taken like if you've taken like five years off of strength training, you're going to come back and you're going to make quicker progress than when you were just starting out. But it has uh, to do with like the groove in your brain is still there to be able to uh, recruit as many muscle fibers as it can, as many motor motor units as it can. I don't think uh, I don't think there's anything to say that like having the, the muscle memory itself is going to help you in any other way than that, because at the end of the day, it's still about cross sectional area. Like a lot of people think that male muscle and female muscle is different. But no, not really. Like if you have the equivalent amount of cross-sectional area in either and equivalent uh, percentages of type one versus type two muscle fibers, they're going to have the exact same strength with like no statistical. Do men and women there. carry the same types of fast versus slow twitch muscle fibers on across their, not on average, because that doesn't matter, right? It's about over like specific muscle groups. Oh, no, well, no, because um, what picks your muscle fiber percentage is your parents. Like, uh, well, well, I'm talking so, like, is there a gender driven difference? Not like a set, not like a parent driven difference. Like, is it the case that women tend to have more fast twitch muscle fibers in their lower body and men tend to have more fast twitch? Like, it's something like that. Is that the case? Not or? that I know of in terms of like body parts. Uh, and even if there was, there's so much individual difference that it's hard to make like gender categories. Men do tend to have a greater percentage of type two muscle fibers uh, and, men, and women have a greater percentage of type one. But again, this is like very, very, very uh, different between individuals. Like at the top levels of endurance sports, you're going to see like men and women with very very low percentages of type 2 muscle fibers and in power uh, and like sprinting and uh, sports like that you're going to see the opposite regardless of gender you're going to see they have a really high percentage of type 2 fibers so uh, that has more to do with like athletes self-selecting based on what their muscle type percentage like genetically is more so than like a sex driven difference uh okay i don't know if that's true now but i'll just i'll assume it's true there's a couple people in my chat screeching about it so but okay um <clears throat> all right what other what is the next 
what's what next um i think that's everything i wanted to talk about uh, i hope that do you think like, that I, well so h- how do you reconcile with the idea that it seems like trans women the latest reviews show that even after three years they retain uh, significantly greater amounts of um, lean body mass versus cis women. What is your... Uh, my main argument against that was like because they're taller. Like you got That's why you have to match for height for the reasons that we talked about. Like a taller person has more lean body mass than a shorter person. Mm-hmm. And so if, if that's the standard you set, uh, it's not a good standard because if they met that standard, they'd be emaciated. Like, so you got you to <clears> compare <throat> apples to apples. So and then... When they've done that, a lot of the differences have got much, 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 much smaller. Still statistically significant, mm-hmm. uh, but it's you, they've really, really honed down and got that uh, difference is much smaller. Can you, uh, you shoot me one of those right now? We can actually just read it. I'm just curious on that. Uh, I'm super putting you on the spot here. I understand. So if you want to shoot it to me later or whatever, I'd be curious to see when no, that controls were high. Yeah. I think, because it's in my script, if I can find the source, mm-hmm. if I can find where I say that, I think I can find it pretty quick. Okay, yeah. What is the quickest way to get back there, guys? Oh, my God. Um, yeah. What, so, here, so here's another question. Um, let's say that if we... Um, let's say that we um, get to a I point... I to you in chat. Oh, gotcha. Hold on. Well, I, I sent a citation to it, not a link. I'm sorry. Tell me where you were at the beginning. Um, gotcha. One second. Um, actually, hold on. I'm just not going to talk for a second. Let me just teleport out of here so I'm going to die. <clears throat> okay. You guys are saying I can teleport to the main academy gate and go there? Um, okay. Let's see. Bojangles. Oh, fuck. Can we find an online print of this? Obviously, I can't. The citation doesn't do anything for me. <laughs> uh, hold on. Mm-hmm. You have no scruples about using Sci-Hub, do you? It's Russian. It's okay. I want to send you a, a Sci-Hub link. Fuck. Well, I want to try to send you a Sci-Hub link. Oh, yeah, actually, that's an- another question. Does lean body mass difference have to be controlled for for height when lean body mass is a percentage of your overall weight? That's body fat percentage. That's body but le- fat isn't percentage. lean body mass usually measured in, like, percentages, or no? Um, it can be, but the way they've done it here is just gross uh, lean body mass. Like they just said, like, just the gross lean body mass as opposed to percentages. That's interesting. Okay, I'm waiting for... A sci hub link. This. Let me know if this doesn't work. I'll try to find the page for you too. Okay, muscle strength, size, and composition for only 12 months of gender affirming treatment to transgender individuals. Just a question. I swear to God, I'm not trying to get you here. Is this actually okay. published or is this just a paper that was written? I think the way SciHub does it is that they might pull from things like that. It is published because mm-hmm. this is this is one of the studies that uh, Hilton and Lundberg pulled from. Gotcha. So I know okay. it's, well, so, because sometimes if you do so that when you say that was one of the studies they pulled from, did they pull from this to create like a meta analysis or was it just a literature review? Uh, I'm going to be honest. I forget what the difference is between them all the time. It was a literature review. OK, gotcha. But yeah, okay. this is published in um, uh, J Clinical Endocr- oh, fuck. <laughs> uh, Endocrine Society. Journal of Clin- uh, Clinical Endocrinology. And Wait, so hold on. So I'm reading this result. So thigh muscle volume increased 15% in TM. Usually when people say TM in these studies, we're talking about trans men, which was paralleled by increased quadriceps cross-sectional area, the CSA, 15% in radiological density. Don't care about that. And trans women below, don't care about this. So the trans men increased strength over the assessment period, which is what we would expect, while the trans women generally maintained their strength levels. Isn't that a bad thing? 
Um, and then the conclusion is one year of gender affirming treatment resulted in robust increases in muscle mass and strength in trans men, but modest changes in trans women. These findings add new knowledge on the magnitude of change in muscle function, size, and composition with cross hormone therapy, which could be relevant while evaluating transgender eligibility rules for athletic competitions. I do apologize that it's been like a long time since I read this study. I no, know yeah, for a fact. I, I swear I'm not lying because I have <laughs> It's fine. Uh, it's okay. It's like, I'm I not like trying I to get I swear it's in, the, uh, it's in the video. Sure. But there's for a, people there's that don't know, um, I, like I, me and uh, Bojang, we've hung out before at like some of the debate events or whatever. I don't think you're like a bad faith actor or anything crazy like that. Don't worry. Uh, I'm going to try to find, because I know I pulled from the uh, pulled from the chart where they like uh, did the height match comparison. Mm -hmm. uh, but this one doesn't have any charts in it at all, the one I, the one I sent you. So I got to like find where I've actually, like, I guess Sci-Hub might be giving me a different chart mm -hmm. or give it give me a different version of the study sure it's possible yeah, yeah. oh okay it's it's not a chart but height adjusted control f height adjusted okay hold on control f height adjust like a hyphenated word or Yes, I've made. Okay, data analysis changes over time required to grasp. I guess me guys. Okay, figure five. I'll read figure five. Oh, they have a uh, way down at the bottom. So yeah, figure five. Had adjusted value for muscle strength also greater in trans women than. Cis women and trans men at T12 are for muscle volume. This difference remained only in the trans women versus cis women comparison. While there were strong correlations between muscle size and strength at baseline, the correlation between the change in size and change in strength was also moderate in trans They put women. the uh, figures down at the bottom. That's why I couldn't see them for a second. So it's page 27, figure 5. Sure. Despite the, so I'm just going through now. So despite the robust changes in lower limb muscle mass and strength in trans men, the trans women were still stronger following 12 months of gender affirming hormone treatment, both in absolute and height adjusted values. Mm -hmm. um, However, they're they're much much closer together. I even I even said that they're still statistically high, statistically higher, mm -hmm. but when you adjust for height, the difference becomes a lot lower. Sure, so, I imagine the difference probably start. I that's almost certainly going to be the case, right? But there's still a difference now, and I think this is at 12 months. I've, I think in the 36 month review, I think it was similar though. Yeah, the argument that I've made, I think I've made it a few times before. Uh -huh. It's a lot easier to like visualize uh, if you scroll down to figure five, way like near the bottom uh, and look at like the middle two, like TEW12 and CW. That's like what we're comparing the trans women after 12 months and the cis women. Uh, it becomes a lot closer together. And the argument that I make is that, yeah, they're still starting a little bit ahead, but these are untrained individuals. And so after there's, they're still gonna be approaching the same ceiling. So oh, wait, hold on. Talk. This is a study. I didn't even consider this. This is a study of untrained individuals? Yes. Most of them are. The only okay. one that I'm aware of. Wait, wouldn't the trained individuals, individuals like, wouldn't this be exaggerated even more? Oh, wait, hold on. Um, this, hold on. Now my brain is recontextualizing everything. So if you go through periods where you don't do resistance training, you can bleed muscle mass pretty quickly, right? Like that's mm -hmm. one of the biggest things somebody will tell you to cut is you have to keep working out. You absolutely have to, otherwise you're gonna atrophy, not atrophy, but like you're gonna lose a lot of muscle mass. But if these are non-trained people, then these people are probably bleeding muscle mass much quicker than an athletic trans woman. So even in the non-trained trans woman category, they're still retaining a statistically significant difference between untrained cis women athletes or cis oh, women. Oh, I'm sorry. Like, yeah. So uh, with so athletes, wouldn't it be even more present, pr pronounced? Yeah, so, so for athletes, they'll bleed muscle mass way faster than untrained individuals because otherwise, like untrained people would just be constantly bleeding muscle mass at all times, right? Well, no, no. The reason why the untrained person is bleeding so much here is because they're changing from male to female, right? So there's going to be a big bleed off there. But if right. you're training from a trained athlete male to a trained athlete trans woman, um, I would expect to see a higher percentage of that muscle mass retained than a, um, than a I don't know, it, I, it's not, it doesn't make sense to say cis male, than an AMAB, I guess, transitioning to a trans woman because they're just going to bleed off whatever their genetics or hormone profile matches, right? I don't know if that would be the case because 
again, like if you're really, really drastically reducing the rate of protein synthesis, you might not be able to hold on to that increased levels of uh, muscle mass that you had when you were training. Not all of it, but I thought that he, um, I feel like I read similar language that the cha that the um, drop off of muscle mass was modest at 36 months for trans women that were undergoing resistance training. Um, it, it still happens, but they do maintain a surprising amount of it. Um, they did the best study that I'm aware of uh, on that is uh, the one done on the Air Force pilots, or yeah, Army I've, pilots, some kind of pilot. There was a, um, I think it's and that was British oh. Journal of Medicine 2021 Review Trans Athletes. Let's see if I can find this. Yeah, so, so in this one, like when you looked at the performance benefits, like the, the trans women start uh, after I think two years, they dropped to doing the equivalent amount of push-ups. Now some people think that like that means that like they still have an advantage because they're bigger and taller and therefore stronger. But like I, I don't think you can make the argument that like they should be doing fewer push-ups and that would make it fair. Uh, and the biggest thing there, like they they still maintain like a 12% advantage in. Uh, their run times, I think it was a 1.5 kilometer run, 1.5 mile run. So mm -hmm. not like a super long, but like, you know, a, a run. And the biggest thing there is probably due to that height. So they have, you know, longer strides, which means fewer strides. So that height advantage still very much is there, but we've hammered the height thing enough. I still think that that's tolerable. That's a tolerable advantage and not an unfair one. Fuck, am I gonna find this? Hold on. I think I just ran into one of the Air Force ones. Oh, this is in the end. Um, hold on. Someone said that, uh, in your YouTube chat said that the charts don't, they don't overlap at all even when adjusting for height. Um, maybe increase the resolution because, yeah, they do. Not much. I, I, I'll still admit, this is still a statistically significant difference when, mm -hmm. even when adjusted for height. So, fully admit that. But when you do that, it, it brings them way closer to parity. Uh, the difference between the absolute levels and the height adjusted levels is like <clears throat> way, way, way smaller. Fuck. I think Brandon had, um, I think Brandon was the one shooting these links a few days ago. Does anybody remember? I believe it was a 2020 review. And I think it included um, longitudinal studies that were 36 months long. Um, does anybody have a link to one of these? And then we can go over this or read this. Are you not talking about the British Journal of Medicine one? Um, that's what I just looked at, but that looked like the the push-up one from the air force oh, okay oh you're looking for a different one yeah i thought i thought i thought there was a different one that looked at um i thought it was 36 months tracking athletes over and then they were looking at things like lean body mass and stuff when we needed brandon he disappeared when we needed him the most fucking loser um <clears throat> Let's say that, um, well, it, it sounds like we agree there will still be some advantage. Mm -hmm. um, if it was the case that there was some advantage, and then if we bring back in our understanding that the, um, if we bring back up the understanding that there are significant height differences, and if we keep moving forward in a direction in a society where we are more accepting of trans people, they're more comfortable transitioning, um, existing in society, et cetera, et cetera. Do you think that at some point in time we should start to see a disproportionate representation of them in sports, in, in, in women's sports? Probably. Again, be, just because, like, assuming, like, we don't, like, start uh, puberty blockers and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. as, as if we're assuming that, like, the same levels of... Yeah, you know, I'm, to be clear, I think that if you do puberty blockers, if you don't go through puberty as another sex, I think at that point we're talking... It's a way different conversation that I'm probably yeah. almost fully on board with, right? So, I, yeah, so, so be, yeah. throwing that aside, if, if we just have, like, a trans woman uh, transitioning after puberty you know, and transitioning as adults, I would say you would probably have a disproportionately... Uh, as more and more trans women could be, you'd probably have more uh, disproportionate amounts of them... Uh, doing well, but again, that comes down to like because yeah, because they're a lot taller. Like so, then uh, do and, we? Is that just and I, that? Mm -hmm. And that is an advantage, absolutely. But I don't think it meets that threshold for un intolerable unfairness because we don't, you know, categorize by height in any other situation. I don't think it's sure. We don't categorize by height. We do categorize by sex, and height is one of the biggest differences, right? Just like we don't categorize by muscle mass. We don't categorize, but those are still sex sex difference driven things as well, right? Well, we do categorize categorize by muscle mass in terms of by proxy through weight, right? In yeah, but we could argue we categorize by height through proxy by sex, right? 
Maybe, but again, uh, if we you really, really break it down, like what is the reason that men and women are separated in sport? And it's because of that, in, uh, the lean body mass concerns. That's really what it comes down to with other things mattering, like height, but they don't, uh, they, they are factors, but they're not the factor. In my opinion, maybe not the really most, maybe a pretty big one. But so here, I guess here's a, so like getting off of this, if we ask like a social question, I, I think that the issue, like a really big issue that potentially comes up is, what do you do when you start to see trans athletes taking up multiple like top slots in teams or starting to get really good placements in national level competitions? It feels like the scary thing is that one, it's obviously going to be a huge resentment driver. Um, two, you've kind of damaged arguably the integrity of like women's sports. And then three, I think that people realize that like if you get to that point, once you get to that point, you're never going back. Like, or if we do go back, we're gonna go way back. It's gonna be really bad. So optically, I really, really get that fear because like, that's why people are honing in on the transport stuff. Not because they care about women's sports, but because this, this seems like the easiest dunk, mm -hmm. no pun intended, uh, to like haul trans rights. I get that, but I also wanna ask like, if everything was completely level, wouldn't we still see the tra trans women winning? But we still see some of them winning, some of them uh, taking like high spots, some of them even setting records. Like, I don't think it's fair. I, I think it's a weird, really weird like expectation that a lot of people seem to have that if if it was fair, they would never win. Almost, Not that, that they would, would like, never win, but I'm saying like a disproportionate representation. Like trans women are already like a very very like you would rarely ever expect to see them win anything, right? Because they're po it's like what one percent of the population. But if you right. started to get to an area where like first and second in like a national level composition was like trans women, it would be like a national uproar. Like shit would be fucked, right? It would, yeah. I don't know if that's happening though, because like, <clears throat> well, I don't, I don't think if so. I, I will 100% uh, admit I have the motivated reasoning coming in here, mm -hmm. uh, which is that like, uh, my question instead of asking like, is it fair for trans women to compete in sports? My uh, my line of questioning is how do we make sure that it is fair? And that's where the motivation comes from. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm trying to look for. And I think uh, based on the research that I've done, I think it is possible reasonably. But again, I want some more research to be uh, to happen. And with that question, I obviously I really do understand <clears throat> why that looks bad, but I still maintain my position that like there that that height is the, is the major advantage of why why they would be disproportionately taking up those spots, and mm -hmm. I don't think that meets that standard of unfairness that we've talked about. Do you think that most women competing in those sports would feel like that doesn't meet the standard, or do you think they would just see like really tall trans men coming in and then dominating and feel like, wow, like. They're, they got they to grow be. as like male puberty bodies and now we're like can't we're not competitive anymore it seems to be that like uh women athletes don't have a more uh, don't aren't any more critical of this issue than the, uh, any of the other any of the rest of the population sure at the it's moment i would imagine but that's why i'm asking like if it if it, i think i feel like if it came to the point to where like top one or two slots in like some competition like went towards like trans women there would be like an uproar it would be like really bad yeah honestly i don't know i, I mean it would obviously look bad uh, but I don't know if my opinion would change. I would, I would have to see this happen. So, and again, I want to see a lot more research done on like what's the best way to go about this. So you I, don't think that's, that's well, a don't, super wishy-washy answer. Yeah, I understand. The, the comparison I always use is like, um, so <clears throat> I hate the NRA. Um, I love guns, but I'm sympathetic towards the NRA arguments, which is that like, even if you have some reasonable gun legislation about like a mandatory psych test or felonies can't do whatever even if you have something that like most people would agree is like pretty reasonable they're scared to give any ground because then the fight in the future is going to be over something non-negotiable so better to keep the fights right now over stuff that doesn't matter rather than to give here and then in the future start fighting on stuff that's really important that you could lose on and i feel like even if that seems like a really intellectualized process i feel like intuitively people might feel that way that like once you've let this out of the box pandora's box if like a couple trans women start like nailing major competitions oh hello um yeah then i'm sorry my monitor just turned off once a couple like trans women start nailing competitions you're like shit is fucked it's never going back it... uh that is a question far beyond my area of expertise so, well, but like reasonably, we could say that, right? Like, we're never gonna probably make. Well, fuck, who knows? Actually, would say sorry, but like, chances are, um, we're never gonna make like gay marriage illegal again or something, right? right. Like, we're probably not gonna walk back. Typically, like, progressive oh, rights right. keep marching forward and forward with the with maybe abortion being challenged there. Um, so, like, that's I think that's a reasonable fear. And then, like, if like two or three trans women did hold the top three places in like some athletic event, 
you are like the, the they're not going to like delete the records right like that would be pretty unfathomable as well no now, the, the only thing i can say on that is that i think it's reasonable to assume that, that it can be done fairly and of course there will be situations where trans women win and because they uh, you know, if they transition after puberty, there's they're probably going to have that height advantage. So I do acknowledge that it's probably going to be a higher percentage. Uh, like if everything, if more trans people start competing, they're probably going to hold that higher percentage of victories, you know, proportional to their uh, status in the population. Mm -hmm. But I still don't think that's unfair because I still uh, had those same arguments that I've, I had from the beginning. That's I still don't see it as scientifically unfair. I think there's a good. Uh, basis in exercise physiology to say like why this is okay this uh, doesn't well, have this level of intolerable unfairness it's scientifically unfair but we can philosophically justify it by saying that we shouldn't focus on height really right because scientifically we acknowledge that the height advantage is real and it's very important but like we can philosophically get around that by saying that like well you know we're controlling for sex not height so fuck that yeah, I guess that's a better way to say what I just said mm -hmm. yeah Thank you for making thank you for making my argument better with, with, with your superior words. Well, sure. oh, yeah, actually, well but yeah, I think that argument is say. weaker, though, right? I think that's the issue, is that, like, some people aren't going to be satisfied by it. People will say that, like, there's a broad range of female bodies that we accept, but what we don't accept is male bodies getting an advantage and then becoming female and competing with us, right? Mm -hmm. And then even when controlling for height, there are still advantages there. So you have people that are super tall compared to you and still do maintain some advantages and have like a smoother hormone cycle because it's, if they come outside of you, is that called exogenous hormones? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that sounds way smarter than exogenous. external. So yeah, you have exogenous hormones. Um, and then there's like a lot of other stuff like that you don't have to worry about. Like you don't have to worry about anything related to menstruation or periods or anything like that. So it seems like, and then like your body fat percentage can arguably be lower as well. So it seems like, even at the rawest part of like controlled for height data, there's still an, an advantage. And then there's like, but that's already after having hand waved like four or five other potential advantages too, right? Wait, hello? I was muted that entire time. Oh, sorry. sorry, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> I, fuck, all right. Mm -hmm. Got to back up because I was talking for like 20 seconds. Oh shit, sorry. I was pr it probably sounded like I was cutting you off a million times. Sorry, your mic was just muted. <laughs> <laughs> no. the, to summarize really quickly, what I said basically was that like at the rawest part of like the pure data, even at the height controlled level, there's still a small advantage. And that's after hand waving a lot of what we both agree are huge advantages. Like height is going to be a huge advantage. Getting an early start in your training in a male body is going to be a huge advantage. Having like bigger feet and stuff and like. Um, getting like a smoother hormone cycle, not having periods, not having to worry about like having as low body fat. Like these are all going to be big advantages, right? Yeah. So what I think a reasonable expectation that we might see in the research uh, going forward is that since if we switch to actually like looking at athletes, mm -hmm. uh, that that rate of protein synthesis dropping so much is going to have a much greater impact on their in terms of like the percentage of muscle that they lose. Like so an athlete, I would expect even with training that they're going to, if they were pretty muscular before, that they're going to lose a greater percentage of that because that, you know, the more muscular you are, the greater rate of protein synthesis you, you need to have to maintain that muscle mass, which isn't going to work the same way as it would with an untrained person. So I do think it's reasonable to expect that when we do those studies, match for height, all that good fun stuff, that the, uh, that what little advantage, what little statistical difference there is when you do that height match comparison will probably be, will probably overlap enough to be fair when you get to levels like olympic fair. stuff though aren't you like aren't you hyper selecting for like very small specific advantages that like where like a two or three percent difference in olympic shit is going to be like really significant yeah they weren't and we're also pulling from a wide variety of cis women uh who might also have these inherent advantages so like with men and like with open categories uh like it's it's easy because you get the best of the best but then you have with closed categories like we do a sex uh, uh categorization in the women's category now all of a sudden it's way harder to like really 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 nail down the line mm -hmm. so a lot of people will point out the fact that like the ioc says you have to keep your testosterone levels under 10 nanomoles per deciliter i believe mm -hmm. is it which is still and pretty high compared people, to cis women well very high yeah cancer, right? yeah that's what people will say like well that's like 10 uh, not 10 but it's like five Four times time, higher yeah. than what the average yeah, it's like five times higher what the average cis woman has however that rule isn't there for trans women it's there for cis women some cis women just naturally produce crazy high amounts of testosterone and so they're going to self-select into sports where that would be beneficial i don't so think I, that's anywhere near the average competitive 
woman though. It's not like they're all sitting at like nine nanomoles per liter or whatever, right? No, but that's why that rule is there, not to not to you know accommodate. I thought the rule wasn't there necessarily just for like really high like cis women. I thought that was because sometimes you run into like strange intersex cases. Uh, a little bit of both. Like it's there, uh -huh. there's like isn't that um like, the Semenya whatever person isn't Castor Semenya? Yeah, isn't she is she an XY chromosome female? Am I, I, that up? I forget exactly what's going on there, but yeah, she was like she's mm -hmm. not a trans woman. She was assigned female at birth, lives as a woman. Yeah, and so like, but I think she might have had XY chromosomes. I might be making that up because I, there I, are, there are types of like where you can have XY chromosomes, but you have like a certain type of androgen insensitivity. And um, if you have that androgen insensitivity, you don't like develop as a male as much. I remember this. I right. was in that sort of house. And that really illustrates the importance of like, well, you don't win sports with chromosomes. You win sure. sports with endocrine profiles. Mm -hmm. So like if you have that androgen insensitivity, well, you're going to, no matter what your chromosomes are, it's going to drastically reduce the amount of uh, performance advantages uh, you're going to get because like, like there's no receptors for the thing that's going to help you build muscle. Okay. Um... Hmm. <laughs> well, anything else? Um, not that I know. I hope. Uh, I do worry that I can come off a little bit wishy-washy, but because these well, are I mean, all like, my best guesses. Yeah, I. These are all my best guesses, and I think that I've. I think I can justify scientifically why I think these things are the way they are, without fully saying definitively this is exactly what's going to happen. Uh huh. I understand what you're saying, but I feel like I'm wholly unmoved in my position or even more yeah. like solidified in it because like uh so i failed well because i i mean like we acknowledge that an advantage still exists even when controlled for height and then we know that height differences are there we know that there's going to be big advantages because trans women get exogenous hormones don't have to deal with periods um get to train earlier uh, as a head start. that point well it's not i'm not trying to say like that's the one thing but i mean like all of these are factors that the problem is that these advantages are driven sexually that and i think that's why they all feel so unfair or feel bad like in a vacuum like one or two of these things would be a big deal but the fact that all of these things are driven by sexual differences and the leagues are split by sex is what makes it all feel kind of not good i would say something i, I see a lot is that, like people will try to list all the differences like between the sexes like they'll list as many of them as they possibly yeah which and a lot of these are pointless them. sure yeah a lot of them are pointless and a lot of them are just driven by the same things like a, like testosterone a, a ton of the differences are just driven by hormones mm -hmm. and that's it sure so like uh uh yeah my main argument i think i think i'll say it uh, like the fifth time is that like yeah height is an advantage we acknowledge it's an advantage however it doesn't meet that threshold for intolerable unfairness because we don't control for it in any other sport in no other situation if you pull it away from transports would you consider height a, an unfair advantage so that's what you're looking for not just advantages but unfair advantages yeah but i guess what makes it unfair is kind of we're like begging the question right and it feels to me like the unfair thing isn't whether or not it gives you a really big advantage the unfair thing is whether it's driven sexually or not that's like the unfair part i guess yeah, it is incredibly hard to like dictate methods of fairness in, in sport because there are a thousand other there are a thousand different factors that can go in. Uh, it's like what constitutes an unnatural like is it does it matter if it's natural or not? Like can you get like unnatural advantages uh, that are okay? Mm -hmm. uh, can you take substances that will help your uh, athletic performance and are those okay or are those not? Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of different ways to like circumvent things like <clears throat> uh, altitude training. Like living at a high altitude and uh, training at a low altitude confers the exact same uh, performance advantages as something like blood doping, but one's allowed and one's not allowed. Sure. So it is very hard to like really nail down where that fairness is in sports. And I think I have, uh, I'm confident in my case and my justification uh, for why things like height don't really constitute that un that intolerable unfairness. Mm -hmm. And why the most important factor for sex separation, that difference in the hormonal profiles, uh, which lead to increase in uh, protein synthesis, which leads to more muscle, which leads to better sports outcomes. Since if that is taken care of, we have taken care of the singular most important reason as to why we have the categorizations in the first place. We've taken away the upper limit. We've taken away the limiting factor and made ends achieved something close to a reasonable degree of parity. So that's why I, that's why I think the way that I do. And I'm pretty sure, like, I'm, I'm pretty confident that, uh, it can be justified scientifically, but then you talk about like ph philosophy and then stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, hey, listen, I appreciate the conversation. Yeah. Uh, thanks for having me on. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. All right. Stay safe. Take right. it easy. Be careful.
was born forever and ever. That guy's name is Bo Jangles. No, it's not. I don't know why I call him. Oh my god, his name is Jangles. Somebody can link his chat. <laughs> 